going to ask you all to please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Judges chapter 9. So Judges chapter 9, guys. <clears throat> While you're turning there, uh, last week we wrapped up chapter 8 uh, with the death of Gideon. We were told he died at a good old age. And we also saw that after uh, his victory over the Midianites, uh, Gideon had taken many wives, and we were told that he had 70 sons. So quite a few sons. However, we also learned that Gideon had a son with a woman uh, whom he wasn't married to. Um, actually, uh, she was his concubine, uh, and she was from a city called Shechem. Okay? She was a Shechemite. Now, the name of Gideon's son uh, with this concubine is a man named Abimelech. Abimelech. And so in our Bible study tonight, we're going to take a look at chapter 9. Uh, we're going to finish it out. We're going to see the rise and fall of this man Abimelech, all right? And so we've got 57 verses to cover. Uh, so let's get to it. Uh, we'll pick it up now in verse 1. It says this. Then Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel, went to Shechem to his mother's brothers and spoke with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Please speak in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. Which is better for you, that all seventy of the sons of Jerubbabel reign over you, or that one reign over you? Remember, I am your own flesh and bone. And so right off the bat, we're introduced to Abimelech, and we see something. that Well, he has an agenda, doesn't he? We're told that he travels to his mother's city, the city of Shechem. And so Abimelech goes there, but not to visit his mom, not to say hi, but rather he goes to address his mother's brother, brothers, that is, his uncles, and the rest of the family, we're told. And he begins to sort of lay out, you know, an argument before him. And he asks them, you know, what would you guys rather have? Would you rather have seven of Gideon's sons rule over you, these 70 Jewish men, you know, or would you rather have just one man rule over you? Of course, Abimelech was speaking of himself here. He reminds them that, well, he's a man of their own flesh and bone. Not only family, but his mother was from Shechem, like them. And so what was Abimelech's agenda here? Well, to be the ruler, or the king of these people. That's what he wanted. The opposite of his father Gideon. You remember what Gideon told the people when they tried to make him king? He said, I'm not going to rule over you, nor will my sons rule over you, but the Lord will rule over you, right? Right? Either way, Abimelech tells him to go ahead and, you know, start spreading this around. You know, start spreading it around the town. Ask which they would rather have, 70 foreigners over them or me. And so they did. Check out verse 3. And his mother's brother spoke all these words concerning him in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. And their heart was inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he is our brother. And so they gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Bereth, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless men, and they followed him. Then he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the 70 sons of Jerubbabel, on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, was left because he hid himself. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, all of Beth Milo. And they went and made Abimelech king beside the terebinth tree at the pillar that was in Shechem. And so the people of Shechem decide, you know, it's going to be better uh, for us to have one of our own rule over us than 70 Jews. And so they say, look, let's follow after him. Let's follow after Abimelech. After all, he's one of our brothers, right? That is a Shechemite. And so they, they kick him down with some startup money. Okay, 70 shekels of silver. 
70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Bereth. So a temple built to one of their pagan gods. And Abimelech takes this 70 shekels and he goes out and he hires, you know, a bunch of bad guys, okay? Reckless men, we're told. We're told they followed him. Next, we're told that Abimelech and his hired men head to Ophrah. Okay, you guys may remember that's uh, where Gideon's hometown was. That's where he was buried, is what we learned. And it was there that Abimelech gathered up Gideon's sons, his own brothers. And one by one, he has their heads chopped off on a stone. Now, when you do the math, he paid 70 shekels. And, well, he had 70 of Gideon's sons' heads cut off. That's one shekel per head. And so just in this little few verses that we've learned about Abimelech, I mean, we stop and we look what we've seen. First, we know that he's an evil man, okay? He's got an evil agenda. He takes evil money from an evil temple. He pays evil men to do an evil thing. It's a whole lot of evil right there. You could probably tell now that Abimelech isn't going to have a happy ending, right? After all, the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Don't be deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Okay? And we're going to see that tonight, big time. Anyhow, we're told at the end of verse 5 that the youngest of Gideon's sons, a young man by the name of Jotham, well, he managed to sneak off and escape. Now, the men of Shechem decided to follow Abimelech even though he had committed this atrocity and they made him their king. Now, he wasn't made king of Israel. Okay, Who remembers who the first king of Israel was? Anyone? I heard it somewhere. Saul. That's right, guys. King Saul was the first king of Israel. But Abimelech was made king of, you know, Shechem in little neighborhood cities around there, okay? So he wasn't the king of Israel. He's the king of Shechem. But now as we continue into verse 7, we come to what's called the parable of the trees, okay? The parable of the trees. And here's a little fun fact for tonight's Bible study. Uh, this is actually the first parable in the Bible, okay? First parable in the Bible right here. And was all parables... Um, in the Bible, there is a lesson to be learned. And so let's take a look now at verse 7. It says, <clears throat> Now, when they told Jotham, he went and stood on top of Mount Gerizim and lifted his voice and he cried out. And he said to them, Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. And so this one who escaped, the youngest of Gideon's boys, he climbs to the tip top of this place called Mount Gerizim, which overlooks the city of Shechem down below. And Jotham, he takes this hill and really just turns it into a pulpit. Okay? And, and you know, he, he begins to yell at the top of his lungs. And he says, you better listen so that God will listen to you. And he speaks this parable beginning in verse 8. The trees once went forth to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I cease giving my oil with which they honor God and men and go to sway over trees? Then the trees said to the fig tree, well then you come reign over us. But the fig tree said to him, Should I cease my sweetness and my good fruit and go to sway over trees? Then the tree said to the vine, Well, you come reign over us. But the vine said to them, Should I cease my new wine, which cheers both God and men, and go to sway over trees? Then all the trees said to the bramble, You come reign over us. So here's what's being spoke of. We're told there's a group of trees, okay? A group of trees. And these trees, they go to an olive tree and ask it to reign over them, to be their king. The same with the fig tree and the vine. They go to each one. And each one says, no, 
I won't do that to the group of trees. And so they finally go to the bramble, we're told. Now, the group of trees that are searching for a ruler to go over them, well, that's speaking of the people. The group of trees is the people. The olive tree, the fig tree, and the vine, well, those are good men, like Gideon. Remember, the people tried to make him king, rule over us, and what did he say? No. No, I won't do it. Why? Because God is your king. I'm not your king. God's your king. And so in this parable, the group of trees finally goes to the bramble, and, and it's, 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 what it is, it's a bramble bush, okay? And so think of it like a big tumbleweed, all right? And they ask this tumbleweed, this bramble bush, to be their ruler, and what does the bramble say? Well, the bramble jumps all over it. Look at verse 15. And the bramble said to the trees, Well, if in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. And so do you see what the bramble's doing here? He promises them, Hey, if, if you choose me and anoint me king, well, I'll cover you with my shade, right? That's what the bramble bush said. Come and take shelter in my shade. But here's the thing, guys. Brambles don't give shade. They're just tumbleweeds. They're just a little tumbleweed bush. <laughs> and so it's a false hope. It's lies. And the bramble shows its true colors at the end of verse 15 by threatening the trees. If you don't pick me to rule over you, then let fire from the bramble burn the trees. Fire is about all the bramble is good for. You know, something that you may have noticed as we've been going through the book of Judges is, you know, uh, the topic of leadership keeps coming up over and over, right? Um, applications towards leadership over and over, right? And some of you might be thinking, well, I'm not, you know, in leadership. You know, well, this doesn't apply to me, but, but it does. And the reason that that keeps coming up is because we're in a book about leadership. The book of Judges. Okay? That's what a judge is. That's why God raised these judges up, was to lead the people. And so we see here another application to leadership. When you look at the Bible and you think about the men God called to be leaders you'll notice something that they have in common. Moses said, Lord, I can't speak well. I'm out. Jeremiah said, Lord, I'm just a kid. I'm way too young for this. I'm out. Peter said, Lord, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. Paul said, I'm the least of the apostles, and I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. But then you have the brambles. Brambles like Abimelech. They have agendas. They want to be the leader. They want the titles. They want the prestige, the power, the respect. They say, I will gladly rule over you. But the truth is, all they really have to offer is fake shade. False hope. Lies. Nice. And I think the scripture shows us that most of the time, you know, the best leaders never really wanted or intended to be leaders. But God takes those fears, those doubts, those imperfections, and he uses them to his glory by making them leaders. And so in this parable, we see that the trees that were the most qualified, the trees that could give the real shade, were the ones who least desired to rule. And the least qualified, the one with the false shade, was the bramble which desired to rule the most. You know, Jesus taught his disciples the difference between true leaders and bramble leaders. 
In Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28, Jesus, speaking to his disciples, said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. That's what Jesus said. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, brambles don't come to serve. Brambles come to be served by trees. Just like Abimelech. He didn't come to be a servant to the people, but he wanted to be great among the people. And that was his problem. And so in verse 16, Jotham, he's still standing on top of Mount Gerizim. And now he's going to take this parable of the trees and he's going to apply it. He's going to apply it to the Shechemites down below. Shechemites, that's a funny word. Let's take <laughs> Shechemites. He's going to take a, take a look with me, Jotham says in verse 16. Now, therefore, if you have acted in truth and in sincerity in making Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jerubbabel and his house, and have done to him as he deserves, for my father fought for you, risked his life, and delivered you out of the hand of Midian, but you have risen up against my father's house this day and killed his seventy sons on one stone, and made Abimelech, the son of his female servant, king over the men of Shechem, because he's your brother. If then you have acted in truth and sincerity with Jerubbabel and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. And so Jotham, he starts, he's up there standing on this hill. He's preaching down. He brings to remembrance what all his father Gideon had done. Remember when we see the name Jerubbabel, it's actually referring to Gideon. Okay, that was his second name. Okay, uh, it means, you know, Baal contends. Remember Gideon went and he tore down the uh, altars to Baal that his father had built. And he contended with Baal. And so they gave him that name, Jerubbabel. Okay, so that is Gideon. And so Jotham says, you know what? My father was like an olive tree. My father was like a fig tree. My father was like a vine. He covered you. He sheltered you. He brought you out of the hand of Midian. But he says, you guys killed his entire family. All 70 of his sons. And he chose a bramble bush, Abimelech, to rule over you. He says, if my father truly deserved this, then so be it. You and Abimelech have every right and should rejoice in each other. Verse 20, but if not... In other words, if my father didn't deserve what you did, let fire come from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come from the men of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. So if this was done in truth and sincerity, then rejoice in each other. But if not, let fire come between Abimelech and the Shechemites and devour one another. And we know that none of what Abimelech and the men of Shechem did was done with truth and sincerity. And so after Jotham is done rebuking the entire city, basically, he figures he better hit the road, okay? Or he'll be next on the chopping block. So verse 21, And Jotham ran away and fled, and he went to Beer, and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. Now, after Abimelech had reigned over Israel three years, God sent a spirit of ill will between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, that the crime done to the seventy sons of Jerubbabel might be settled, and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother, who killed them, and on the men of Shechem, who aided him in the killing of his brothers. And the men of Shechem set men in ambush against him on the tops of the mountains, and they robbed all who passed by them along the way, and it was told 
Abimelech. And so we see, just as Jotham said, you know, now there is this devouring fire between them. A spirit of ill will that was sent by God himself to uh, cause animosity between uh, Abimelech and the people that chose him to be their king, the Shechemites. Okay? And so verse 26, Now Gaul, the son of Ebed, came with his brothers and went over to Shechem. And the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. So they went out into the fields and they gathered grapes from their vineyards and they trod them and made merry. And they went into the house of their God and ate and drank and they cursed Abimelech. And so in verse 26, we're introduced to a new character here. Gaul or Gale. I'm not sure exactly how I've heard it pronounced both ways. The son of Ebed. We're told he went to Shechem, and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. And that was a mistake. We should always put our confidence in God and not in men. Men fail. Men will always fail. God's never failed, and God never will fail. Either way, they go out, they gather grapes. They crush them, they make some wine, they go to the temple of their false god, and we're told they get merry. <laughs> so, two and two together, you have wine, and then you get merry, okay, without a doubt, speaking of getting drunk. Um, and so they started partying. Verse 28, then Gal, the son of Ebed, said, who is Abimelech anyways, and who is Shechem? that we should serve him. Is he not the son of Gideon, and is not Zebul his officer? Serve the men of Hammer, the father of Shechem, but why should we serve him? If only this people were under my authority, here we go, Bramble, then I would remove Abimelech. And so he said to Abimelech, increase your army and come out. <laughs> and so Gal, we see another power hungry guy here here he is he's all drunk he's hammered running off at the mouth like drunks do right got that liquid courage in him <laughs> and like abimelech gal he's just a bramble bush full of false promises he says if i were in charge i would get rid of that abimelech guy and then he yells out and tells Abimelech to build your army and come fight me, right? Of course, Abimelech was nowhere near there. <laughs> uh, Gal was over in Shechem and Abimelech was out toward Ophrah. Uh, but you get the picture. You know, he's like yelling out, come fight me. And verse 30, when Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gal, the son of Ebed, his anger was aroused. And he sent messengers to Abimelech, secretly saying, Take note, Gal, the son of Ebed, and his brothers have come to Shechem, and here they are, fortifying the city against you. Now therefore, get up by night, you and the people who are with you, and lie and wait in the field. And it shall be, as soon as the sun is up in the morning, that you shall rise early and rush upon the city, and when he and the people who are with him come out against you, you may then do to them as you find opportunity. And so Zebul, he's really like a city manager. He overhears Gal's drunk talk, and he goes off, and he tips off Abimelech, right? Tells Abimelech, hey, you know what? A great way to get back is to ambush these guys. He says, just go duck down and hide in the fields, and when they come out into the kill zone, you know, you can ambush them. Verse 34. So Abimelech and all the people who were with him rose by night and lay in wait against Shechem in four companies. Now when Gaul, the son of Ebed, went out and stood in the entrance to the city gate, Abimelech and the people who were with him rose from lying in wait. And when Gaul saw the people, he said to Zebul, Look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. 
But Zebul said to him, Oh man, you're just seeing shadows of the mountains as if they were men. <laughs> and so Gaul is still probably a little faded. You know, from partying the night before, he goes to the city gate and he sees way out in the distance there, you know, what looks like men coming down the hill. But Zebul knows if Gaul realizes what it really is, he'll run and escape from Abimelech. And so Zebul tries to mislead him by telling him, look, they're just shadows on the mountains, man. They're just shadows that look like people. That's all it is. Verse 37. So Gal spoke again and said, yeah, I don't think so. See, people are coming down from the center of the land, and another company is coming from the diviner's terebinth tree. Then Zebul said to him, I like this, where indeed is your mouth now? <laughs> the mouth with which you said, who is Abimelech? that we should serve him. Are not these the people whom you despised? Go out if you will and fight with them now. In other words, last night when you are all, you know, loaded, running your mouth about fighting Abimelech, saying we shouldn't serve him and increase your army and come fight me, he says, where's your mouth now? Because there he is. He's right there. And so verse 39, Gal had no choice. He had to man up. He goes out leading the men of Shechem, and he fought with Abimelech. And Abimelech chased him, and he fled from him, and many fell wounded to the very entrance of the gate. Then Abimelech dwelt at Aruma, and Zebul drove out Gal and his brothers so that they would not dwell in Shechem. And it came about on the next day that the people went out into the field and they told Abimelech. And so Abimelech beats down Gal and his brothers. They chase him out of the city. And so what happens the next day, the Shechemites, you know, they're thinking it's all good. It's all said and done. You know, they go out into the field like nothing's happening, right? But remember, they also were merry and put their confidence in Gal. And remember, there was still a spirit of ill will between them. And not only that, but they were also guilty of being a part of Gideon's 70 sons dying. And so they're in for a rude awakening. Verse 43. So he, that is Abimelech, took his people... He divided them into three companies, which is interesting because that's what his dad Gideon did. That's the second time. I'm starting to think, I wonder if it was the same time last week. <laughs> okay. Just the Lord teaching us patience, long suffering. All right, so verse 43. So he, Abimelech, took his people. He divided them into three companies. And like I was saying, um, you know, it's interesting because that's what his dad Gideon did. Uh, when, you know, he went and fought the Midianites. Remember, they had a torch and a trumpet, and Gideon divided them up into three companies, 100, 100, and 100. Well, here his son is, you know, uh, doing the same thing. And he looked, and there were the people coming out of the cities. <clears throat> and he rose against them, and he attacked them. Verse 44. Then Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city. And the other two companies rushed upon all who were in the fields and killed them. And so Abimelech fought against the city all that day. He took the city, and he killed the people who were in it. And he demolished the city and sowed it with salt. And so Abimelech attacks the Shechemites for a whole day. We're told he's slaughtering them. Uh, we're told that he demolished the city. He sowed it with salt, okay, which means nothing could grow there after that. And now verse 46, 
When all the men of the tower of Shechem had heard that, they entered the stronghold of the temple of the god of Bereth, so pagan god. And it was told Abimelech that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. Then Abimelech went up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people who were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand, and he cut down wood from the trees. And he took it and laid it on his shoulder. And then he said to the people who were with him, What you have seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. Also what Gideon told his people. And so Abimelech here, um, he hears these Shechemites, they're hiding away in this tower, right? So he goes to the mountains, he cuts down some wood, he throws it on his shoulder, he tells the people following him, you know, do the same thing. Verse 49, And so each of the people likewise cut down his own wood and followed Abimelech, put them against the stronghold, and set the stronghold on fire above them, so that all the people of the tower of Shechem died about a thousand men and women. And so here's these people, right? They're hiding in this tower, pagan God. And his men take the wood they cut down, they lay it at the base, they light it on fire, and they burn a thousand men and women alive. Okay. But Abimelech didn't stop there. Check it out, verse 50. Then Abimelech went to Thebes, and he camped against Thebes and took it. But there was a strong tower in the city. And all the men and women and all the people of the city fled there and shut themselves in. Then they went up to the top of the tower. So Abimelech came as far as the tower and fought against it. And he drew near the door of the tower to burn it with fire. But a certain woman dropped an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. And so the evil Abimelech has now met his end. He goes to a tower. We're told first off it's a strong tower. He has evil in his heart. He prepares to burn the tower down. When suddenly a woman drops a millstone from the tower and cracks his head wide open. Abimelech goes down like a sack of potatoes. Verse 54. Then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and he said to him, Please draw your sword and kill me, lest men say of me a woman killed me. <laughs> so his young man thrust him through, and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man to his place. And so Abimelech's mortally wounded here. He's in grave condition, millstone to the dome. And in his dying moments, he asks his armor bearer to kill him. Not because of the pain or anything like that, and my suffering, you know, it wasn't like that. But because he didn't want to go down in history as being killed by a woman. Well, he did. Because we're talking about it right now, right? <laughs> so it didn't work. But you see the pride of this man, even in his death. His final moments, he's worried about losing that title and that rank. And so we're told the armor bearer runs him through with his sword and Abimelech goes on to face God for what he's done. And so we're at the end of the chapter now, and the end of the story of the wicked Abimelech. But what's the moral of the story? You know, what, what's the take home? Well, it's given to us in the last two verses of the chapter. And so as we come to a close tonight, let's look at, look at it together. Okay, verse 56. Thus... God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father by killing his 70 brothers. And all the evil of the men of Shechem, God returned on their own heads. And on them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbabel. 
See, the application is this. <clears throat> Abimelech did wicked things. And God repaid him with wickedness. I mean, he took 70 heads on one stone, and in the end, it was one stone that landed on his head. Right? And then we have the men of Shechem, who not only gave Abimelech the money to hire these assassins, but also agreed to go along with it. The murder of the 70 sons, they were just as guilty. God will repay men who do wicked things with wickedness, and he will return evil upon those men who do evil things. It took three years, we're told, but God did avenge. Jotham had every right to seek revenge for his brother's murders, but instead he gave it to God. In the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 17 through 19, the Apostle Paul tells us this. This is a verse I held on to. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And if it is possible, as much depends on you, as best as you can, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And that's what we just saw. The exact word used. The Lord repaid the wickedness of that man. There's one last thing I want to point out. The second tower Abimelech went to. Okay, We're told the people fled into that tower. We're told Abimelech was unable to burn that tower down. The people were safe in that tower. And it was described to us in verse 51 as a strong tower. Let me read to you Proverbs 18 verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Jesus Christ is the true king. He's the true ruler, the true olive tree, the true fig tree, the true vine. He offers cover, shelter, and real shade to everyone who seeks him. And just like Proverbs 18 says, Jesus is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Guys, there's Abimelechs everywhere. Everywhere in the world today. The world as we know it is falling apart. Violence, disease, hatred, murder. It's everywhere. And so here's a closing question. Are you in the strong tower tonight? Are you in Christ Jesus? Because the time is now. Despite everything we see around us, guys, there's no safer place that exists than in the strong tower that is our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're in that tower, then you can have peace knowing that you're safe even when the Abimelechs are burning this world down. And you can also have peace knowing that any evil that comes against you in that strong tower, that is Christ, will have its head crushed with a millstone. No safer place to be. And so are you in that tower tonight? Guys watching at home, are you in that tower tonight? Let's pray. And so, Father.